Hi, I'm Jane Hutchin, and in July 2010, I created One Plus One, and up until September 2019, recorded nearly 500 interviews. In this series, I'm bringing together my top 10. They're the conversations which have taken me by surprise or somehow had an impact on me. I hope you enjoyed this interview with writer and former Olympian, Casey Legler. Casey Legler, welcome to One Plus One. Thanks for having me. I listened to a radio interview with you the other day and I thought, you know, that doesn't do justice to your physicality. Mm. Are you aware of your physicality, do you think? That's a really cool question. Um, so I was this height, I was 6'2 when I was 12. And my father is 6'8, uh, my brother is 6'10 okay. now. <laughs> and so we all just kind of, yeah, there was never any sort of self-consciousness around it or anything like that, just because my family was so tall. We also moved around quite a bit. And so we moved around kind of as this like tall pod <laughs> of humans, you know, traveling. So, um, so I don't think I was actually quite aware of my physicality until probably like my mid twenties, I think. Yeah. So after my swimming oh, career. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Because your family moved between the States and France. You were born in France. I was born right? in France. Yeah. Born and raised in the South of France. That's where I'm from. And I'm totally bilingual. I should have been a spy or something because I, I don't have an accent when I speak French. Well, you've blown either. it now because yeah, I know, you, know, right? so you can't be a spy. <laughs> I cannot be a spy. Yeah. What were your parents doing in France? Yeah, so my father was a professional basketball player and then got his master's in architecture and became a developer. And so you, my mother, she uh, was also a, a landscape designer and so they worked together quite a bit. And, um, you know, they went over, I think, in the early 70s. And my father now, rest in peace, has passed. But my mother is still over there in the south of France and shares her time between the south of France and England. I live in New York with my wife, Siri. Who's Australian. Who's Australian. <laughs> she is. She is. She introduced me to Australia. I mean, I am enamored with this country. Yeah, absolutely. I um, have a black cockatoo tattooed on my back. And after this, I'm going to get a bowerbird tattooed on the Aww. other side of my back. I have a black swan on my thigh. Like the birds here I'm obsessed with. And I spent um, the past four or five days body surfing on the South Coast, eating fish and chips. Like I just, I, if I could move back here, we would do it in a heartbeat. Casey, I want to talk a little bit about your childhood. You were picked at your young age, mm. 12, mm. to be a swimmer because mm. you said that even though you were an accidental athlete, the coach had seen that you were, in a way, genetic gold. Mm. What did it feel like to have people making decisions about you like that? I mean, I was definitely aware that... Um there was a certain indifference to my well-being or even my preference. Um, and that in that moment when I met my coach for the first time and uh, my mom is there, there was absolutely an awareness that what I wanted to do didn't matter and that the reason I was being asked to do this had nothing to do about my own well-being, but the success I was going to be able to have. And I'm 12. I mean, I was a very precocious young kid. And um, around that age is the time at which I stopped believing that adults had my best interest in mind? No. Yeah, because it was such a profound experience of just seeing that look kind of come over an adult's face and understanding that, well, he was being friendly and totally appropriate. Um, he definitely understood that here's this kid, I was 12, I was 6'2 at that age, who was basically going to be, you know, was made for swimming. 
At one stage, your coach wrote down on a whiteboard what your life plan was going to be for the next six years, I think, leading yeah. up to the Atlanta Olympics. Yes. Again, what, what's it like to look at your future in those terms on a whiteboard? Well, I think so. The, you know, I, th I, you know, so I'm 42 now, and um, so it's been over 30 years since I was a young teenager. And I think about what it, what it was like to train. And so, a lot of athletes who are watching this are going to understand. But the the truth is, is that when you're a, a professional elite athlete. Um, as soon as you get to a certain level, and in swimming you're talking about like 13, 14, 15 year olds, there is a, an understanding that you're on the track to be at the world level. You just kind of like have these goals, you understand what you're going to have to do to reach these goals. And so it wasn't unusual, but it was devastating for me to sit in front of that whiteboard and you know, because I, I hated swimming. I didn't, it was, um, it was such a physically, uh, you know, and I'll use the way, it was a physically traumatic experience every time I got in the water. You know, the water is held at a very, you know, 68 degrees Fahrenheit. So it's, it's quite cold um, in Celsius. I think that's like 18 degrees mm. or 16 degrees. That's competition level because you're training in it for two and a half hours. You get quite hot. But that first moment of getting in was so painful every single time. Is that what started you drinking, the swimming? Oh, yeah, gosh. No, I, I wish that that was what had, I mean, <laughs> you know, it's, um, so I started drinking when I was 12, which is very young. And, um, you know, it was in France, so there isn't a drinking age in France. And I suppose over the years, I've kind of, you know, rationalized it to a certain degree, because it wasn't that unusual. You know, in France, we all grow up drinking wine at the table. So there was a, you know, and all the parties we were at uh, were parties that <clears throat> um, parents had said we could have. There's a word for house parties. It's called a boom. And so you would go and it was, there was an innocence to it. What about your parents? Did they notice anything no, was wrong? I'm one of five um, and both of my parents worked and... I mean, I think that they were just like, we have an extraordinary child, just chuck her in the pool. And she's also getting straight A's in school. And so in many ways, I think they felt that I was the one that was the most okay. I mean, because I was the highest functioning one at that point. Because you said at one stage you got your blood tested for peak performance. I think that yeah. was every month. Yeah. And that there were your liver enzymes, yeah. which showed you were like a 60-year-old man who drinks every, every day. day. Did that not create questions? So, <laughs> my mom had this extraordinary ability, which I think now looking back, I actually kind of feel quite fond about it, um, of just really having such faith in her kids. And in her mind, she just felt she actually did just simply believe that the test was wrong. Like to this day, m my mom is my biggest fan. I mean, and is so grateful that I've made it out alive, but it would never have occurred to her that I was having a hard time. And, um, and the truth is, is that, you know, my mom wasn't the only one. Like my father was the same and he was an alcoholic. So there are different reasons for why that is. But my coaches were the same. My teachers were the same. Every adult around me, as far as they were concerned, until the very end of my using, when I get to university, there really isn't anything that would have led them to believe that I was so devastatingly heartbroken and sad because I was breaking records and I was getting straight A's in school. And those are, those are the, you know, in many ways, those are the points the that you, the benchmarks, yeah, yeah, that you look at to make sure that a kid's okay, you know? And my coach very, very early on when I was 14 sat me down and he kind of like, you know, puts his arm on the bench and he looks at me and he goes, so I hear, uh, that at swim meets, if there is uh, 
alcohol to be had, you are the first one under the table. And I was like, I mean, I was in shock because I just, I also didn't think it was so problematic. And I also was like, actually, you have it wrong. I'm not the first one under the table. I'm actually the last one standing. Mm. So, but do you see, like, but, it but was... But what was his point in bringing that up if it I wasn't think, to help you? I think it was to help me. But I think that throughout, for whatever reason, throughout my own swimming career, all of the adults around me were willing to look the other way to drinking in this instance, but then I was also raped on a training trip. And my coaches looked the other way, even though there were very physical marks on my body that something, at the very least, something bad had happened to me. And so I think that there was a maths that was being made that as long as I wasn't displaying any outward sort of outward of signs that I was okay, and I think that that's the that's the the point in many ways is that that this was normal and it should not have been. So, as you're advancing through your teenage years, you were also sexually abused by a doctor. I was. You're having this drinking problem. It goes into drugs. Yes. I want to take you to the time just before the Atlanta Olympics oh. and I, I know everybody <laughs> talks about this I feel bad no don't but it's yeah. part of your story it is it's an important part of my story and I think it was in the trials yeah you swim the best time ever in your trials yeah in the world in the world yeah and so as much as I hated swimming when I swam fast you were amazing it was extraordinary. It felt phenomenal. Like I'm actually getting goosebumps just thinking about it. The reason is, this is a total segue, but I've learned how to body surf. We just spent five days down on the South Coast and I took this wave and it reminded me of what it was like when I was swimming. The best part of what it was like when I was swimming. So I'm basically ready to move back to Australia and just body surf every morning. But okay. at the time, at the Olympics, um, I was a totally unpredictable swimmer. Like I just, I never knew what was gonna happen. Like I just, I didn't know if I was gonna swim fast. I didn't know if I was gonna swim slow. And why that is, I, I still don't know. So it was this the 50 meters? Oh yeah. It was 50 meters, you're swimming for France. Yeah. There was this expectation She's swum the fastest time ever. Boy, is she going to blitz the field tomorrow. She is going to kill it. I mean, I stopped the pool when I swam that time. Cause I'm I, getting goosebumps yeah, now. The whole, you know, the coaches stopped. You know, there was the Russian coach that had stopped. The coach from Germany stopped. Like, because they looked. Because when I swam, so I was trained to swim like a guy. Because I'm the same height as a lot of the guys. So when I swam, I was very, like like very like a slow moving machine and um ah and then I get up on the block and so I've shaved my head and I totally bomb yeah you, you came about 29th 29th yeah 29th and it would took many many years after I got sober to actually even tell anyone that I had been at the Olympics. Like I wasn't, mm, I was maybe 25 or 26. The first time that I told my mentor, oh, hey, I've done this thing. I went to the Olympics in 1996. Cause I felt so deeply as though I had failed. Like I just, the shame, the, the, the embarrassment. I also didn't know how to talk about, you know, my real experience at the Olympics, which was, you know, I swam really fast the day before, I bombed the following day, and then the following day I sold drugs. Like I just, that wasn't, that wasn't the Olympic story that anyone really wanted to hear. So in a way it feels really good to talk about it now. And I stand in such admiration of this young 
teenager that I was. Like, I just am so moved by her fortitude and her ability to just, like, keep doing everything crazy that was around her. Did that incident play into your, again, more bad news, um, your suicide attempts? Yeah. Yeah, I was a very odd, very special, very quirky, unusual um, and smart kid. Um, but I felt very lonely. Um, that is one of the first memories I have of m me as a as a young child. So we're not even talking about the time after the Olympics. No, this is like an this ongoing, is ongoing sense of loneliness totally. that you've had since you could since remember. Since I can remember, just this mm. deep cavity in the inside of my body. And so when I drank, it went away. So, in a, so, so drinking did save my life, because I think that if I hadn't become a young alcoholic, I pro absolutely, I don't know that I would have made it through being a teenager. Like wow. I, cause I did, I, I did, I was a self harmer. I cut myself a lot um, and I did. I, I tried to, um, to kill myself twice. I'm actually quite, uh, getting quite emotional about it, but I absolutely believe that I have had a second chance cause there is, no reason why truly I made it out of my teenage years. Um, so did my swimming and my um, Olympic experience add to that? It was, it did, but so did everything else. So after the Olympics, that year and a half afterwards, really, my using really, really took off. So when you say you're using? Drugs, alcohol, everything, yeah. Um, and I eventually quit swimming, um, so I lose my scholarship. Um, yeah, the only things I had, I lost. Absolutely, like I lost my scholarship, I lost my ability to look at people in the eye, I lost my dignity, I lost my any joy, I, ev everything. The, the very few things that I had, I totally lost, including the bed in my rehab because I got kicked out. That's right. You yeah. got kicked out of rehab. Mm. I think you were 21 at the time. Yeah, so three days before I turned 21. So, again, just piecing together the, mm. the patchwork quilt of your life, yeah. if you like. You, at the age of 30, graduate from university. I do. You're a brilliant student. Yeah. You love your words. You love your reading. By this stage, was life coming together for you? I mean, did you feel that you <laughs> inhabited yourself? Yeah, so like I said, I got sober when I was 20 and then the first five years were excruciating. I was institutionalized at like maybe 23 because I was still self-harming. I had an eating disorder. Like I got spat out of my teenage years, traumatized, like truly. It took many, many years for me to figure out what I was if I wasn't an athlete, you know, because there isn't a lot of infrastructure for professional athletes once, they, once they're done, then what happens? And so I was lucky because I had mentors and friends around me who were like, okay, well, so you can do this and you can do this and you can do this. So I did. I went back to school and I studied architecture and, uh, and then... Um, then I, I decided that I would maybe go to law school because I really liked the way lawyers, um, the philosophical arguments yep. that they would have. And ultimately, and I'm so grateful, um, I ended up in New York doing a um, video class, a video course. And because um, I'd always written, I'd always drawn, I'd always taken pictures, I'd always painted. And... Um, video was this beautiful place where all of it got to come together. And uh, so I started living in New York as a working artist. And only then, truly, when I was 32, did I land in my body. So that's 12 years afterwards. It's a well, long time. It's a long time. Yeah. But a few years later, you get offered what some people would say is an amazing deal to be a model yeah. through a modeling agency, 
but for male clothes. Yeah, I did. I got booked to um, model on the uh, men's board at a big modeling agency in New York, and um, and it was it was it was men's clothes. And at the time, so now here we are. So I think that was in 2013. Here we are six years later. The cultural landscape has changed dramatically. But at the time, I was the only yeah. one. And so I'm also 36 at this point, um, which there was a part of me that was like, why isn't anyone asking me like about my age? <laughs> like, cause daddy's old. You know what I mean? <laughs> like I was like, that is the part that is really extraordinary about this, you know? Um, but in terms of my body, um, and, and I think oftentimes there, there's, um, you know, a curiosity about my own identity and my own gender. And in many ways, modeling was, um, was very natural because I just got to model the clothes that I really enjoyed. Um, but when there are questions about, you know, what, what has that been like for me and my own identity, it's been an absolute journey um, and I, I don't identify as a man or a woman the categories don't seem to fit yeah. um, and so I feel so grateful for all of the young uh, non-binary gender non-conforming trans queer kids who have come up behind me to help me as an elder kind of have enough language to be able to say oh okay so this is this is, this is me, this is where I feel comfortable, and these categories don't fit. And there's nothing wrong with categories per se, but I do start taking issue with them when they oppress or limit people. Um, and I think that the modeling allowed for that conversation to start being talked about in a more public, kind of mainstream way. Absolutely. Yeah. When you finished writing Godspeed, yeah. you were diagnosed as being on the autism spectrum. Yes. What made you get a diagnosis? <laughs> so this is where I bring in my wife. Gosh, I love her so much. Um, she's an international human rights expert. We met 10 years ago and were friends for many years and then fell in love about five, have been married for three. You know, I'd never really allowed myself to get close to anyone. So anytime anything kind of like came up around questions about why I behaved a certain way or why I was a certain way, I was just kind of like, I'm cool, like we're done basically. So I would split, I would just go and break up with, you know, whoever I was with. And, um, but I was in love with Siri. And so what happened is, so she, we, she and I started sharing space together and, uh, we moved in together and, um, you know, I have a, th anyway, I'm pretty typically autistic in that I have like a pretty strong necessity for, um, environmental control. I'm able to show up for conversations like this um, because I've been prepped, because I understand. So I looked up pictures of what the studio looked like. I really? understand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it turns out that Siri's sister is a specialist in autism. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, yeah. And um, apparently they had a couple conversations that was like, you know, so I don't know, maybe Casey, you know, because it's like very typical for young girls who are on the spectrum to be non-gender conforming. There's comorbidity. We, um, you know, the suicide rate for people who are on the spectrum is actually quite high. So anyway, over, you know, over like the first couple years that she and I are together, um, this conversation comes up in a very natural way. There was no like... You should go and do no, this. No, no. I mean, and it wasn't pathological or... You know, it was just kind Maybe of... Maybe started to get you interested in the idea. Totally, yeah. So I uh, took the initial diagnostic tests and, um, man, I mean, I, I score off the charts. Like, there is no... You know, there's like... I think if, if when you hit, like, 29 or 32 on this particular diagnostic test, which is the first one that you take... You know, they're like, Ma, maybe, and I'm like a 48, like firmly. So I had my friend who I think is, a, I'm like, you're a little weird. Here, you take the test. His name's Brad. Oh my God, I love him too. And I was like, you know, you're like a little, you know, so he takes the test. He tested like a 12. And then I made Siri take the test because I was like, 
these questions are normal. I just answered them naturally. Like, this, this is not right. She scored like a three. Like, it doesn't get more neurotypical than, than, than these people who are around me. Wow. So, so, so it's, yeah. You, you scored well as uh, usual. I scored well. On I am, the yeah, I scored autism really spectrum. <laughs> Did that bring you relief? Totally. Totally. Total relief. Because I just was able to just... Um, kind of let myself off the hook about like truly not fully or always totally understanding what's going on around me, which was the thing that was so hard for me as a kid. You know, like I was like, why are these people like humor sometimes? Can <laughs> I just knew never to venture into anything <laughs> around irony or shade or like anything subtle because I just would never be able to get it Right. So it was a relief. It was a total relief because I was like, ah, oh, you know, I, I'm OK. Like, I'm OK. And this has only been in the last couple of years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's only been in the last, like, four years. Amazing. Yeah, it's great. We've got to finish the oh conversation, sadly. OK. I want to ask you, so you've been talking about body surfing. Yes. You have been back into the water. Oh, yeah. Since all those years ago. Yeah. What does the water feel like for you now? Well, I got back in the water in Australia. It took the boy Charlton pool. It's a beautiful place. I mean. We had great ocean <laughs> pools, you got to say. <laughs> it only took the most beautiful pool in the world to get me back in there. So the ocean, I love. Like, it just um, is the most uh, beautiful experience ever that I have, and I feel so grateful that I get to have it. And I love swimming laps, which I did <laughs> not think was ever going to happen. Um, but I find it quite meditative. It's lovely. Wow. Yeah. It has been such a very great yeah. pleasure speaking with you. Yeah, it's been really nice. Thank you. Thank you for coming on to One Plus One. Yeah, thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. And that's one of my top 10. Thanks for watching. You can watch again on iView. See you next time.